John Hudson, you are a survival instructor, broadcaster, writer, and training consultant. Your work has taken you to some of the most remote and extreme environments around the world. You are a former Royal Air Force helicopter pilot, and you are the British military chief survival, aviation, resistance, and extraction instructor. And today we're here to talk about this amazing book. Let me show it for the camera. How to Survive Self-Reliance in Extreme Circumstances, which is published in several languages, including in Spanish. So this one is in English, but for my compatriots in Colombia, they can read them in, in, in Spanish. John, thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much for inviting me, Alan. It's a pleasure to chat to you. So as I told you a minute ago, this is better than uh, watching a Netflix series <laughs> on survival. Although you are not a stranger to TV and you have some uh, series already in uh, the survival channel. Uh, channel. Okay. So uh, if someone rather see you on video, they can always turn on their TV. But I recommend much better the book. <laughs> Uh, John, I wonder if you could share with the listeners some of your story. How is it yeah. that you got into this? I mean, we can see that you are in the you were in the Royal Air Force, yeah. a helicopter pilot. But is this something that you always wanted to do since you were a little kid, or was it by accident? Is it? Yeah, yeah. tell us how it all got started. Yeah, sure. Well, it, it's a little bit of all of that, really, Alan. It, I'd always enjoyed the outdoors. Um, where I grew up in, in the UK, uh, specifically in the north of the UK, there were some really nice green spaces around a lot of urban centres. And I, I grew up in a village where not very far away there was access to the, the, you know, the great outdoors, which I was really lucky to have. So I always wanted to be outdoors rather than indoors. And I know that like, younger people today get a, lot of, get a lot of flack for supposedly always being on their Xboxes. But I think we're all drawn outdoors when we're younger because it's a little bit of an adventure, isn't it? And, I'm sure parents everywhere will have to keep their eyes on their kids because they're always wanting to run off and find out what's around the next corner. And I was no different. And, and then that my, um, my career choice, I, I'd always wanted to fly. And the Royal Air Force provided the realistic opportunity to do that. And I ended up flying helicopters. And part of flying training is the people who pay a decent wedge of money to train you to fly also invest in an insurance policy, which is they teach you how to survive in case something went wrong with the aircraft and there's a delay between the sort of crash bang wallop and a rescue vehicle turning up. You just don't succumb to the elements because they want to get their money back. They want you to fly again the next day sort of thing. So, or not quite as quick these days, but it certainly was in the past. Um, so flying training involves survival training. And probably because I'd spent a lot of time outdoors, Alan, when I was younger, I found the survival training to just kind of be the next step on a, on a learning process. It wasn't a big shock to my system to be, charging around in the outdoors, maybe with less equipment than most people are used to, you know, just a, a piece of material rather than a tent and a knife rather than a cooking kit. So you make a fire, you make something to hang a pot from and you live off the land. So I really enjoyed that. And consequently, I was in a bit of a minority. And because I was um, quite, quite enjoyed it, I volunteered to do some teaching of it. And that's how I got into teaching survival. Um, because I was the weird guy who enjoyed it out of all the people who wanted to get back in the, uh, in the helicopter. So yeah, that, that's, that's how I got to where I am today. And having done it for a long time, I've gradually um, sort of outlasted everyone who was here before me and I'm now the chief instructor. Wow, amazing. Well, we are living in an urban jungle. I mean, all yeah. we see is tall buildings, cars, yeah. and people are hardly ever exposed to nature. Do you think you are a lost art? I mean, only people in the military and in the woods get to enjoy and experience nature itself and everybody else just gets to see it in TV. I'm lucky, I am lucky. I, I do get to spend a decent amount of time in the outdoors because of my job and I'm, I'm sure we'll go into a bit more detail about how later, but just to say that I think we all have to spend a lot of time in urban built environments these days and I'm certainly no exception. When I'm not training, I'm in an office-based context and I'm doing the same as everybody else, you know, the administration, the writing up the reports, the plans for lessons and courses before we set foot in the jungle or the Arctic or the desert, there's weeks, if not months of preparation that has to go into that expedition. Um, but equally, I think that the whole paradigm has shifted a little bit. We also train our, our guys and girls, the, the 
pilots of the future and of today how to survive in an urban environment because you need to know those skills especially when some of the guys we're training are deploying to hostile areas they have to be able to apply the skills of survival to any environment and that includes urban and the good thing i think alan about military survival which is where it's slightly different from what you may have seen on the tv and certainly some of the things i've been involved with is military survival is much more about that insurance policy it's about giving the students a skeleton key to unlock any environment, including urban. Not so much bushcraft, which is what you see on the TV, which is about kind of learning First Nations, indigenous people's skills, which is an excellent way to get some dosage of nature. And it's a great hobby for people to have. But if we're looking at an insurance policy for people who may have to eject out of a multi-million pound supersonic fighter jet in enemy territory, then they need something that they can remember in the worst case really, really quickly, no matter what's going on around them or who's pressuring them. And that's why military survival is different. And because it's a simple tool to unpack, you can apply it everywhere, including in the everyday, which is what the book's all about. But I think it's important as well to note that even if we are spending most of our normal working days in an urban environment, we still have, almost subconsciously, we do have access to nature. And studies have found that even a small dose of that, even if that's like um, half an hour a day of green stuff, be it an urban park or just the plants that are planted down the street sideways, that will give us the sense of well-being and that that net increase in our morale, as I would call it, of being in nature. And that's tangible because scientists have measured that to be about $50,000 in your bank, the equivalent kind of sense of well-being. So it's not all doom and gloom, even if we are in an urban context. But yeah, I, I am lucky with the job that I do get to spend time in some fairly, really, really remote places. Wow. I live in the city of Montreal and not far away from my house, there's a mountain called Mont Royal Mountain. And oh, yeah. I climb that mountain once a week, every week, just, just to have Brilliant. that taste of nature because that's where yeah. we all come from. We come from, <laughs> we don't come from buildings, we come from the savanna or from the jungle or, yeah. or all this. So is this something you um, suggest for people to get that, that taste of nature regularly? Yeah, 100%. Couldn't agree more, Alan. And uh, like you said, when you take the, the, the short time to, to make the effort to go to a more elevated vista, like a hilltop or something, you do get a, a much better sense of perspective on things, don't you? And it's been said by astronauts that they never come back to Earth looking at it in the same way, because once you've seen somewhere from above, and certainly my limited experience of higher flying, the helicopters I were in tended to be like really low level, but when we're, you know, when we're higher up, you do get a good sense of perspective on how close things are and how interrelated we all are. So it, not just the exercise from going up the, the mountainside every week. I bet that the perspective that you gain from it's great too. And you get fresher air, don't you? You know, the winds are higher altitude. You get that benefit away from the fumes and the, the urban pollution. So yeah, always, always go for a bit of that free time as well if I can, I'll 100% agree. Okay, well, you seem to be a man who feels more comfortable with a machete in your hand or a, a rifle. How is it that, and this is not your first book, so how is it that you decided to, put your machete on the shelf and, and sit down and write your first book. Can you tell us also what is the first book and yeah, what is it that led you to become a writer? So the, the, the books that I've written, the very first book I wrote, Alan, is um, the uninspiringly titled JSP 911. So it's the survival manual for the UK military. And it's about 200,000 words of how to hack it anywhere. Um, and it's written for instructors, not for, not for students. It's for people who've done a little bit and are going to teach those skills. So there's a, there's a lot of weight and depth in that. Um, but it is, it's the sort of thing that you wouldn't want to read from cover to cover. You'd have to dip into and dip out of. Um, and then the, the, the latest book, the US um, How to Survive book, is all about applying that stuff into everyday life. So it's going from um, the stuff I've done as a survival instructor through to what we can all take away, whatever our context is. Um, how I fitted it in. So there are a lot of bits in the book that you just held up a moment ago with the, the blue cover um, about how to manage stuff, including our limited resources. So not just things like firewood and water and shelter, but things like time, um, mental energy. So it's important to know how to manage that. And I use those techniques that I was writing about when I was writing it because I had a full time job. You know, I was I wrote some of the book in a, um, a northern Canada area up on Cornwallis Island in Resolute Bay. So there's the Research Institute, several hours flight north of where you're sat now, that's, it's nearer to the North Pole than a tree. And that's where I think I wrote the introduction from memory. So I was kind of fitting it in between my day job. So I'd come back in from 
teaching with the Canadian Seer School and then do half an hour before I ate my, my dinner in the evening. And that's how I fitted it in. And those are the bits that I wrote when I've been working with the, the US Air Force Seer guys out in Nellis Air Force Base when we've done some desert stuff. And other than that, it was, yeah, just between other jobs. So it wow. is possible to fit these things in. But like you were saying earlier, you've kind of got to dial down some other things. So I was dialing down things that were just the bits I wasn't really so interested in. So I watched less of the news and I just wrote more. Wow, perfect. Uh, but yeah. how, how much of a shift is putting away your whatever tool that you're using to start just typing? I mean, yeah. come naturally? It, or it, it, do you it have sort to... of did. It sort of did. Because even when I'm away, as you, as you put it with my machete, when I'm away in the jungle, I always have a notebook in my uh, yes. leg pocket of my, my sort of soldier clothes, as I call them. Um, and at the end of the day, I tend to write down things. Or if I'm working with local people, like when I've worked with the Inuit up in... Um, up in res bay or when i've worked with the guy the Ivan guys on borneo whenever they're telling me things i like to write it down because once we've written it it's a lot easier to remember it so i've always got a notebook with me when i'm working and i suppose then it just meant that i had to had to teach myself how to type and i'm still a hopeless typer so <laughs> that was the hard part for me trying to do what you would do with a pencil in a waterproof notebook with a computer okay well then can you tell us what is it that inspired you to write this book i think the, the, the ultimate inspiration for it is just knowing, having done it myself, that we can all apply these skills in any environment and, and live better and be, you know, easier lives. I thought, well, why not share that information? I'm not compromising anything that's specifically military skill-based. I'm just talking about how to address any tough situation. And importantly, Alan, the, the bit that we don't often see on the TV stuff is how to persevere through hard times. Because once you've survived the crash, then you've got to address what you're going to do next. And that sometimes can be overwhelming. And I'm really interested in the psychology of it all rather than the hand-eye coordination skills. So it's knowing those bits that are the foundation that allow us to do the other stuff that I wanted to get out into, the, into a wider readership. I mean, it's known about by SEER instructors, survival instructors, but it's not that common uh, to, the, to the guy on the street. So knowing how to persevere through tough things, I think is information we can all use. Wow. You just mentioned the word casually, how to survive. Once you survive the crash, it's nice yeah. to know how to do the rest. And you open the book with a first story of someone who survived a crash yeah. and then Same. had to struggle through the jungle in order to make it to civilization. Can you, uh, in, uh, in a few sentences, tell us about that story? Sure. So I think we learn better if we know a story that is a kind of a proverb and Juliana Kirpka was only 17 when her airplane exploded over the Andes she fell for three miles was her fall was broken by the jungle canopy and the, the chair itself span as it fell and then when she came to the jungle floor a 17 year old kid with no training she managed to survive for 11 days and walked and crawled out of the jungle to civilization so I think that's amazing but the, the crawling and walking out of the jungle is something that others can do. And all that Juliana had was a tiny bit of information to start her journey. Her father, who was familiar with the jungle, had told her that the way to find people is to follow water. So rather than charging around trying to build shelters, Juliana sat and listened. And she heard a trickle of water. And she followed the trickle till it became a small stream, till that became a small river, that became a big river. And then she found a logger's hut. And that's how she got herself rescued. And there's important lessons in that for loads of things. And so the way I've written the book is amazing story that I think is amazing. Look at what they did and why, and then translate that into the everyday. Yeah, well, it's super hard to believe. And she later yeah. on made it to become a scientist and, and, and yes. had an amazing life. Uh, can you uh, share one more story from the book? Yeah, definitely. What kind of thing are you in the mood for? Cold weather, desert, jungle? There's a little bit of everything. <laughs> well, uh, we are in Canada. We're in the winter. And uh, you, yeah. you, talk, uh, you make reference right. to uh, the so, cold weather. You said, what is it, that you feel more like in Mars than in, in yeah. or closer to a tree or something of that? That's nature. right. When we were up, um, and there's a friend of mine who's up there at the moment, actually. When we were working with the Canadian Sea School up in Res Bay, Resolute Bay, the, the temperature when I was there a few years ago got so low that it made the Canadian press that it was colder than Mars that day while we were up there. So it's minus 74 Celsius, something outrageous. I can't remember now, but yeah. And so those sorts of temperatures are little things that we take for granted. And I, this is not meant to gross anyone out, but 
if you try try to imagine now how difficult it is just to go to the toilet at minus 60 minus 70 celsius you know if you get that wrong that could be <laughs> could be a life-changing event so it, it, it stops us taking all that kind of stuff for granted, but we learn from the experts and the experts aren't survival instructors from the military like me. They're the guys and girls who live there year in, year out, and then, you know, pick up the uniform and, and do the patrols as part of their service to their country. So we work with the Rangers and the Canadian Rangers are up there, the, the Inuit guys. I was chatting to one of those guys, Andy, and he told me about the time he was out on his skidoo miles away from anywhere on the sea ice and he had an accident. He went over a ridge in a, a pressure ridge in the sea ice and smashed down and it's it written off his skidoo effectively. And he, I said to him, so what did you do? And now the stereotypical answer would be, you expect that sort of a local guy to, to maybe build an igloo, maybe catch something to eat and then slowly fix the thing and get home. He said, well, what? Well, first thing I did was I got my sat phone out and called my mum and said, look, I'm stuck here, gave her the GPS coordinates, <laughs> and then made myself comfy with my tent and had a cup of coffee. I was like, of course you did. Because you knew that this is a thing that could happen. So you'd thought ahead and you had all the right stuff with you. And that's the kind of metaphor from a cold weather thing that we can take to anything. Because those who do really well in survival, like most stuff, have thought about what might go wrong and have a little game plan for what they'll do. And it doesn't have to be worrying about it. It doesn't have to be catastrophizing. It's just have a small thought, what could harm me and then what you will do. And if you tr apply that to potentially stressful situations, not just the life threatening ones that Andy's on about, things like job interviews, things like um, presentations at work, the things that we feel stressful about, you can perform better. So it's those sorts of takeaways. But yeah, I've had some great times working with the Canadian military. Wow. Yeah, well, for the listeners uh, up here, uh, when I go outside in the middle of the winter, my eyes start crying and those tears <laughs> freezes in my face. Yeah. So that's, that's, yeah. how, that's how it is. <laughs> But uh, you mentioned the Inuits a minute ago, and uh, there has been some concern that the uh, Inuits and other native civilizations, ha they have become so dependent on their phones for GPS positioning that they are losing their actual skills of placing themselves or, or, or navigating to this uh, harsh environment. Yeah, I don't know about that because the, the guys I've worked with have all been consummate professional experts in that region. And I, I think that there's, there's a degree of dependence on technology that we, we all have these days. And I'm not saying that smartphones are bad, don't use them. I'm saying they're great, they're a great tool, but have a backup. Mm. And it's the same in my country. We, um, every summer, every winter, there'll be the story of somebody who's been stuck because they only had a mobile phone to rely upon and either the battery failed or the screen broke. And then, then you start to think about, well, you're only, so, you're only a small thought away from not having that problem. And that's the stuff that we teach to our guys and girls. Have a primary means, have an alternative, possibly have a contingency and possibly have an emergency. So if we're going somewhere really remote, uh, maybe the jungle, maybe the Arctic, we don't rely on mobile phones. We may have them with us, but we'll have three or four layers of stuff, probably including stuff that doesn't rely on battery power that means that we've always got an option to either communicate or, or be located. So that's real world survival type stuff. And that again is stuff we can all apply because if your mobile phone's only got a certain amount of battery in it, then don't use its light as a torch or a flashlight when you're walking home, have a little one on your key fob, you know, the, these are the LED ones that are pens that will be really bright and last for ages. Or, um, well, there's, there's countless other bits of kit you could, you could change stuff for. And the, the next thing I'm thinking about writing about is to do with equipment, but, I think we tend to blame technology quite a lot when actually we are really lucky to be around at this moment in history where so much stuff is made right. so easy. The problem is it's like going to the gym. If you don't use that part of your brain, the navigational bit or whatever, then it will get, will get smaller. So you've got to keep exercising it. So it's nice like you do to go out for a walk, you know, do a bit of navigating, have a look at the view and maybe put your phone on airplane mode and only use it to take photographs. Right. Okay. Uh, well, can you give us some more tips? I mean, this is fine of how to survive in, in, in harsh environments, but can you share one or two more tips of how to survive in this uh, concrete jungle over here? Yeah. In, yeah, in definitely. real life so, of the civilization. Yes, of course. So um, one of the, the things that is, is difficult sometimes, if you've got a lot of tasks to, to think about, is, is to get through them all. And it, it's possible that People will have already heard about techniques like um, only working for 25 minutes and having a break, but that's a brilliant way to expand your concentration time. The other one that's quite good, that's slightly less well known, is if you take something like a pen or a pencil, 
and you put it between your teeth sideways like that it yeah exactly it forces your facial muscles into a similar position that they'd be in if you were smiling and because we are fairly simple creatures when your brain feels your face go into a smiling pattern it thinks you're happy when you're happy when your brain thinks you're happy you are happy so just by if you've got a hard task to do while you sat at your desk by putting your pen in crossways it will make your brain feel happier and you will be more productive and your chemicals in your brain will go into a better balance and the one that's a real uh, a real key that we can apply almost anywhere is if we do get that sense that things are getting a little bit too much or that um, maybe there's not enough time which is a common trigger for feelings like anxiety and panic then all we need to do to address that primal instinct is to do the opposite of what happened when we encountered a predator on the, the, the plains of the past, which is to do what we're trained to do when we're just resting and digesting. So to counter fight or flight, so anything stressful, breathe more slowly. And if you start to breathe more slowly, that will, that will put the chemicals in your body back into a better balance so you won't feel as stressed. If on top of that, you do what our ancestors would have done while they were relaxing around the campfire, which is to chew the, th the food they found. So just by chewing, and you don't even have to have chewing gum. You can almost just chew like a, an imaginary morsel of food. What survival psychologists like Dr. Sarita Robinson have found is that chewing like that, again, drops the stress chemicals like cortisol from our system, makes us feel more relaxed, makes us feel like we're sat around the ancestral campfire and the stress of the day will wash away slowly. So there are little things that we can do like that that involve no equipment, no time or effort really, but are just little simple life hacks to make things more easy. Okay, well, um, I, I have to admit, this is something that I do several times per day. I do this. <laughs> and uh, it just lightens my days. <laughs> so, um, Why not? <laughs> uh, let me ask you, so you are so generous, you put a free ebook out yeah. there it's in your yeah. website so i'm letting the listeners know you have a free ebook on how to survive this pandemic so yeah. can you give us one or two tips on how to survive the pandemic as well because we're still yeah. in the midst of it i don't know how long it will be before we all get that vaccine and yeah. we still have to deal with isolation yeah and that's it's the same over here if it's any consolation i think most people are in pretty much the same spot as you or i are the, uh, the pandemic free ebook, How to Survive a Pandemic, John Hudson, um, the, the key things in it, there's a little bit of understanding your enemy, knowing why, and I wrote it uh, in March last year, so there's a few things in there that, that your listeners will hopefully be super familiar with now. What they may not be as familiar with is the way that people who are isolated because of their jobs deal with that kind of situation. And so just like when I was writing the How to Survive book, I looked at people who are consummate experts in isolation and what can we learn from them uh, and one of the main sources of, of sort of information were lighthouse keepers so maybe 30 40 years ago before it was all, all automated around the island of the united kingdom there were hundreds of lighthouses and each lighthouse had a small crew of people on it and what they managed to do over the course of uh, you know several days stranded somewhere was work out a really good routine that made sure everybody stayed on an even keel psychologically, was nice and efficient, and tempers didn't get frayed, which can happen if we're closed in with other humans for extended periods, as I'm sure most of your listeners have experienced. So what they do, lighthouse keepers did, I should say, is at the end of their shift period, they would make sure that they, before the end of their, their shift, they would put the kettle on, they would make a nice pot of tea, they get the next person who is due to be on shift awake, bring them onto the shift, and then not just say, thanks very much, see you later, and get the, the heads down, go to bed. They'd wait with them for half an hour, drink a nice cup of tea with them, because tea's got all kinds of good stuff in it, as well as caffeine. It's got L-theanine in it, which means that your, um, your alertness doesn't crash when it runs out. It sort of lasts for longer. It's a steadier burn, if that makes sense. And by having a 30 minute chat with somebody and a nice cup of tea because of the chemical benefits, the chat in itself brought the other person to a more alert state, let them know what was happening. And importantly, that interpersonal conversation meant that they could each check each other out and make sure they were doing okay. Because one of the first senses we lose in any survival situation is the sense of humor. And you'll have witnessed that, I'm sure, with people who've got a short, snappy temper that are normally quite joyful. So the lighthouse keepers teach us a few things that we can translate by things like this, Alan. So 
checking in with our friends for a video call, using that amazing technology to our advantage, not just talking to them on the phone, but having a look at each other and making sure we're doing okay. Because some people are more isolated than others at, this, at these strange times, aren't they? Uh, especially the elderly, you know, if they're, if they're on the phone or if they're able to do this kind of conference call. I think it's worth taking a, a leaf out the lighthouse keeper's books and doing a quick chat with friends and relatives who we can speak to across the globe. I mean, it's amazing, but you can talk to people almost anywhere now. John, I don't know how to thank you enough for your time. I wonder if you could tell the listeners one more time the title of the book and where they can follow you because you have a, a, a lot of information in your website. Oh, yeah. Well, if they, if they want to, johnhudsonsurvival.com is my website. And then How to Survive, Self-Reliance and Extreme Circumstances is the book that you've been very kind to read and, and to say such nice things about. Cheers. Thank you, John.